Great. Thank you, Danielle. I greatly appreciate it. We've got a very exciting panel today. We've got two lawyers and two accountants. Almost sounds like we should have like a WWE wrestling match here between law and accounting. So we're here to discuss NFTs this morning, and uh, it's great to see so many people out so that we can discuss this subject. So early 2021, we have this boom in NFTs, creating momentum around blockchain tokens, uh, commoditizing assets like art, intellectual property. You've probably seen some of the news stories about art trading, the first tweet and how much there was a capital loss on that tweet which uh, we're hopefully going to talk about this morning. It's been lightning fast, the adoption of NFTs, but it's in a regulatory gray area. And so we're hoping to add some clarity for you today uh, about that. We're going to talk about perhaps some of the protections that can be put in place from a legal and industry governance perspective. And so we're joined here by Melissa Smith, partner at Bordner Ladner Gervais LLP. Uh, she's a partner in the Securities and Capital Markets Group in the Calgary office. She focuses on mergers, acquisitions, and plans of arrangement, and on financing transactions, including public and private offerings of debt, equity, and convertible securities, and compliance with corporate and securities regulatory requirements. We also have Phil Long, who's a partner at KPMG Law. He practices in corporate and securities law in the business law group. He advises clients on a broad range of matters, including capital raising, mergers and acquisitions, and other corporate transactions. He advises clients on securities regulatory matters in respect of token generation events, ASFTs, and trade trading platforms. Now, on the accounting side, <clears throat> which she tells me she has a black belt, by the way, so I'm backing the accountants. <clears throat> Krista Rabideau. CPA, CMA, EA partner at Anderson in Canada. She recently received a master's in legal studies of taxation from the University of San Francisco. She's not only a certified tax professional, but also a life coach and a team builder. We have Matt McGuire, co-founder of the AML shop. Matt is a forensic accountant who likes the challenge of setting up systems and investigations uh, he has set up investigations to frustrate money launderers. Uh, he leads a team of 40 professionals. He's a sailor. Uh, he has money laundering war stories from across the globe, and he takes his martini with a botanist gin and a twist. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Okay, so the first question to the panel is this. So seemingly overnight in 2021, NFTs became a household name. Uh, with billions of dollars piling into the market and many people losing significant sums of money as a result. First, what are NFTs and do you think investors need protection uh, with regulators or with regulators helping them? So, Okay, I guess I'll, I'll lead that one off. Um, so first of all, like at law, from a, from a legal perspective, an NFT, I always say, is nothing. An NFT is a digital recording or digital record of ownership or or, or, or or something to that effect. At law, it's it's nothing. So when you talk about an NFT and should it be regulated, it, the question is, well, what is that NFT? What does it do? What bundle of rights does it have? What do people expect or the, what do purchasers expect that it has? And so, uh, you know, the, the blanket question, should they be regulated? Who knows? We don't even know what, what it is. So then you get to the next layer of, well, so you look at what that NFT does. Is it a security? Does it provide rights in terms of uh, um, uh, copyrights or or other intellectual property? Does it does it do something? Is there another smart contract that could be attached to it that does something? It's in its inf infancy now. Like we don't even know what NFTs might be used for in the future. So the real question is, you know, not should they be regulated. The question is, well, what does this NFT actually do? And you have to look at it from from that perspective. And then you go to the next level. Okay, well, what does it do? If it acts and looks like a security, well, we have securities laws. If it provides some kind of intellectual property, we have intellectual property rights. And, and, and those are pretty well-worn um, paths and, and territory in the legal world. We know how they work. The question is, well, this is a little bit different. So the way I view it, and, and we've seen this with, with um, cryptocurrencies, is you know, someone makes a determination that, well, if it does this and it does that, then it's a security or it's this or that. The problem is our current laws and regulations may not actually fit with 
how they work. It's your, you're a bit of a, a square peg in a round hole. So do they need new regulation? I, I don't know. What we can do is we have to look at it through the lens of, is does this look like something that's already regulated? And rather than new regulation, maybe you know, the regulators or those who are, who, are, who are legislating these things just have to provide guidance to say, well, you know, it doesn't really fit in this category, but we view it as this and that's why it does. And maybe we tweak some of the regulation that currently exists at the edges and that's how you address, you know, you know uh, well, well, an, an NFT, but that's really how you address some form of existing property type that just happens to be in the form of a digital NFT. So that's my view on how it probably should be done. The next, I guess the third, the third pillar of the argument is always, well, what is the purpose of the regulation? Why are you doing it? And I, there's, you know, I come from a securities law background. So in the securities law world, there's, there's two real um, functions, I think, um, that regulators get at. One of them is consumer protection. The other one is efficient markets. And so you have the, certainly in the blockchain space, the no regulation, anarchist, you know, there shouldn't be any regulations, freedom for, for everything, which is, you know, a, a view and a, and a particular worldview. And some people think that's actually beneficial to, to individuals, but is it beneficial to the market? So if you look at efficient markets, everyone's buying NFTs now. They don't even know what they are. You don't know what rights attached to them. So if all of a sudden people realize, oh, I bought an NFT of some image, but I didn't get the copyright. I didn't get any intellectual property in it. I got nothing except the right to say I own this piece of digital nothing that I can't actually exploit for any other purpose, they're, you know, they're not gonna like what they bought anymore. And then everyone's gonna sour on the market and the market falls down and everyone realizes this whole thing's a sham. So part of regulation is not just trying to oppress the individual and oppress freedom, it actually is strengthening the business. So when you look at it from that perspective, I think there, you know, some, some um, regulation in terms of investor or purchaser education is important. People need to know what they're buying, whether again, whether it's new regulation or it's just typical consumer protection. If you tell someone you're selling them this and they get it and it's not that, or you, you know, there's some underlying defect to it, you should be able to return it. Like there's, we have consumer protection just like you buy something in a store. So there are, you know, there is existing regulation that may exist or that, that works for NFTs, uh, maybe with some tweaking or some, some guidance. Um, but I, I don't know that you could really have an all encompassing Here's the NFT law uh, that, that governs everything. So, sorry if that was long-winded. No, no, that was perfectly fine, and I appreciate it. I just want to go back to the first part, right? So really, in, I'm a lawyer by training, so I apologize if I'm using jargon here, but a functional approach, right, is what does this NFT do, right? I take it that's what you're getting at is, yeah. you know, like, is it evidence of ownership? Is it uh, evidence of ownership of a share, which is subject to regulators? Uh, where ownership of property may not be, uh, right? Like Jordans, or not that I'm wearing Jordans. <laughs> <laughs> if Those I are the was, new Jordans, everybody. Maybe there's an NFT <laughs> attached to them saying that they're authentic Jordans, right? Yeah. Uh, but, you know, as you quite rightly pointed out, we're looking at consumer protection, perhaps. And uh, as the Alberta Securities Commission, I'm sure, would say, is integrity of the public marketplace. So, no, I appreciate that. Anything to add, anyone on the panel? In relation to NFTs. If not, we'll go to our second question, and that is the relevance of security law to NFTs has been a gray area, but there are signs that more clarity is starting to emerge. Uh, we've seen Bill 13, uh, which was uh, introduced recently. What are some of the ways that regulations around digital assets and NFTs are changing in Canada? And Melissa. Yeah, I'll take that one. Um, a lot of uh, what Phil just said applies here as well. You know, it is unfortunately not an easy answer. It's not a yes or no. Um, crypto assets, I think from the beginning with coins was a challenge for regulators because you can't just say the way you can with a share in a company, yes, it's a security or no, it's a, not a security because it covers, as Phil said, such a broad range of different products that do different things and are made for different purposes. So, you know, is there clarity? I think, um, it's still always going to be a case-by-case -case analysis, so it's never going to be an easy answer. I do think it's clear that the basic fundamentals that applied, you know, five years ago when people were looking at whether coins were securities also apply to NFTs. So that's, uh, I'm sure everyone here who's ever heard a lawyer talk about this has heard about in the U.S. it's the Howey test or the Pacific Coin test. So really looking at, you know, is this an investment in a common enterprise where you're hoping to make money based on the efforts of a third party? So that's going to really depend. So when we talk about an NFT and you're talking about truly a unique 
item um, that the value is set because of personal preference, uh, a collectible. And if it increases, great, you know, but it's not because you're hoping that a company is going to be promoting it or is going to be developing something that will increase in value. I think it's pretty clear probably that's not a security. Um, but there's a lot of gray area and it gets grayer and grayer all the time. So whereas there is some commentary, you know, NFTs might not be securities, then you start seeing fractionalized NFTs, which is another whole area where people are buying a small piece of an NFT that someone else holds. And if they're doing that because they think that person who holds NFT is going to do something that is going to increase the value of that NFT, I mean, I think then you're back squarely in that test. So it is a security. So it's just an example of it really is case by case. It depends what the security does, what rights are attached. Um, and it also depends, I think, on how you market it. So people need to be really careful if they're marketing something saying there's going to be a secondary trading market, this is going to increase in value, this is a great investment. You're getting more and more into what a security looks like and what the security regulators have dealt with before. So, I mean, I think there's clarity in that there's a framework. Um, is there going to be clarity, like I can tell you this NFT is and this NFT isn't without doing a detailed analysis? No. I don't think we'll ever get there. I think crypto assets are a totally unique um, type of product. Uh, we just haven't seen before. I, something that I find really interesting about them is that they actually, you could have um, one, one product that can actually change. It could be a security in one case and not a security after. We saw that with some ICOs where people were issuing coins to raise money to develop the technology, in which case it probably was a security. You're raising money. Someone's going to develop something that's going to go up in value. But then later on, that might be being used as a utility token and not a security. So it um, is a really interesting class. I think the regulators have a really hard job. I think they're doing a really good job. I think they're talking to people. They're trying to understand. They're setting up things like the sandbox in the securities world they have that concept and then also um, with uh, bill 13 something else they're looking at and that gives people time it gives people a chance to go in to develop something to get compliant without being compliant right at the beginning and when you have something that you don't have an easy answer to that's an analysis that might change as you develop it I think that's really necessary so uh, clarity as good as it gets maybe <laughs> Uh, one thing I want to pick up on, because I think Melissa mentioned it, and it's, it's a good point. The, the, one of the difficulties in Canada, which is the way our country is set up, is we have federal and provincial laws, and province by province by province, the laws can be different. And I think in the early days of the securities um, analysis with, with the tokens and the ICO boom, we had you know, there was a lot of jurisdiction shopping. It says, oh, well, don't go to Ontario because, you know, there's sticklers. Go to this jurisdiction because the Securities Commission's a little easier there or they have a different view. And I think that, that made everything challenging. And I think, you know, in fairness to the securities regulators, I think a, a lot has changed and there's a lot more uniformity and this and the, the, you know, the national association, the Canadian Securities uh, Administrators have come together with uni a unified approach in a lot of cases. And I think, as we, as this area develops, if other areas were, that are provincially regulated could come together and come up with some unified um, approach to to um, to these products, it, it would be helpful to the market. Because of course, these things are global. There really aren't any jurisdictional boundaries in the in the technology. So how to say, well, it's this in this province, and this province allows it, but this one doesn't. Let alone internationally, it, it's it's a challenge in this country to do anything uh, without a, a unified approach. So I do give kudos to the securities regulators on that front. Yeah, and just uh, in addition to you brought up the U.S. a little bit. So the U.S. has brought in legislation late last year with respect to crypto in it being, quote unquote, a currency in their mind for anti-money laundering rules and the reporting that's going to be required on a going forward basis starting in 2023. So Canada's not quite there yet. But uh, the U.S. generally has a further reaching arm and most people who have any type of an investment in a U.S. stock or anything like that, you know you have to fill out this U.S. form, W8 Ben, to say I own this. So the question is, if your wallet, if your whatever is in the U.S., are you now going to have to fill out and declare this of some form or fashion? So it's going to be interesting to see how that unfolds because it is supposed to set to take forth in 2023. The reporting requirements um, for anti-money laundering, investment income reporting, et cetera, that's going to be received just as we receive a T5 slip here. You'll receive similar type of form from the U.S., so it's going to be interesting to see how that kind of unfolds because in true the U.S. fashion, they put it into place and then they figure out how to do the details afterwards. So uh, we'll see what happens with that. 
Well, one aspect of that law that's interesting is that uh, because it becomes currency, it also becomes reportable if you go across the border. Um, and so th what they're grappling with now is, when do you cross the border with crypto? <laughs> right. yeah. Is it because it's in your wallet? Is it because you have an account with a, a, a provider? Um, it's a difficult one to work out. Great, thank you. So Christy, you mentioned anti-money laundering, and this is a perfect segue uh, from Matt, who's our expert in uh, AML. So how are, uh, like how are NFTs treated and used uh, for anti-money laundering, and particularly apropos now, uh, with the sanctions we have against Russia, mm -hmm. against Russian oligarchs, their assets, their associated corporations, how is that being dealt with? Okay, well, so before I get into the speech on how great NFTs are for money laundering, um, <laughs> I, I just want to acknowledge that there are some fantastic legitimate uses for them, right? Like we saw that yesterday uh, with Liam. I, I love the idea that somebody can appropriate their intellectual property um, uh, in, in a global marketplace. That's extraordinary to me. And in fact, you know, going on OpenSea, um, uh, just a couple of days ago to look at, you know, what was out there to buy recently. You know, you see a whole bunch of people in Ukraine who are selling pictures of the devastation they're suffering as a means to raise money. I mean, this is uh, an extraordinary development, and so I'm a big fan of NSTs for a whole bunch of reasons. Okay, now why it's great for money laundering. Um, so <laughs> here's the thing. Um, you know, um, Let's, let's stick with art for a moment, because I think the point's been well made that um, it, if an NFT is a security, it's a security. There's a whole bunch of anti-money laundering rules around that, too, um, and securities rules. So let's stick with art for just a moment. So art is extraordinarily abused across the world for money laundering um, in three principal ways. So one way is an exchange in value. So you're saying, listen, I want to actually use this art to pay for something, or I want to manipulate the value of the art so that I transfer value. So uh, I sell something worth $100 for a million dollars, and the obscurity of what the value is uh, permits me to transfer that value. The second is a way to hide funds, um, right? So art uh, in, in other intellectual property is a great way uh, to park something to make it hard to see, hard to associate with me. Um, you know, so um, we've seen a lot of that uh, in, in in people trying to evade the, the Russian sanctions, especially, um, is that, you know, art doesn't have a, a, a big ticket on it that says, you know, you're the owner. It's like a bearer share. Um, and then the third, which is more commonly exploited in sophisticated organized crime um, groups, is, uh, is when we use uh, the art or, or antiquity as collateral uh, for a loan so that I get what looks to be legitimate funds from the proceeds of that loan. I repay it with illicit proceeds that, that can be funded by it through any number of corporations. So uh, you can imagine as I'm speaking that you know, all these things could be achieved very well uh, with an NFT. And so there's a risk, uh, undoubtedly there's a risk. And, and the risk is, um, you know, you, you compound the risk of, of consumer protection, which is, is this authentic? Is it just a fraud? And so that money has to be laundered too. Uh, and, and in fact, um, uh, it, it just, just steering away from, um, you know, NFTs to crypto for a second, um, the Freedom, Freedom Convoy token, uh, you know, which was ostensibly a means to, to raise money for the convoy ended up just being a means to raise money for the people who were running that scam who have now absconded with all that money. Um, but so, you know, there, there are the bad. So the question is, how do we regulate um, NFTs from a money laundering perspective? And, and the international standards, the, the Financial Action Task Force, which is the international standard setting body for money laundering, um, set about defining virtual currency. Um, and, and virtual assets. And, and so what they said was, listen, um, we think a virtual asset is something that is um, uh, some sort of digital representation uh, or that can be a value that can be used for payment or investment purposes. So you see what's, see what's not there, right? Think about what's not there from the perspective of, of NFTs and you can see where the gray area lies also, <laughs> right? In that, you know, if you're, if you're that person in Ukraine who's selling that piece of art, you, you are kind of using it like a payment mechanism, um, uh, but it isn't. Um, and so th th that's a fascinating thing. The Canadian definition goes one step farther and says, listen, it, it, a virtual asset is something that's a digital representation of value that um, also, um, is either used for payment or investment purposes and can be readily converted to funds. Uh, and that's where all the regulatory uncertainty has come from in, in Canada especially, is that is, is what does that last bit mean? Does that mean, you know, I can auction this off and turn it into funds and therefore it's readily convertible to funds or does, it need, does there need to be an open market 
um, an open liquid market before that, that could be true. Uh, and so NFTs are regulated to the extent that they are payment or securities uh, mechanisms because uh, virtual dealers and virtual assets are covered by our laws. And so the question is, um, how do, do we go the one step further? And my, my kind of concluding point on that is that, you know, the auction markets, the art markets, um, the antiquities markets in Canada are not at all covered for anti-money laundering rules. Um, and ostensibly because in our country, it doesn't look like that's the biggest threat. There are lots of threats we're facing. Um, and so, you know, are NFTs, you know, on the, my top five and priority list to be the next thing to, to regulate? Absolutely not. It's still far better for laundering money. And by the way, this is not laundering money 101. <laughs> idea, okay? We charge so, a very modest fee for that course. <laughs> so, yeah, that is a caveat here. Okay, this is legitimate use of NFTs. So talking about legitimate uses of NFTs and how their government gets their share of that legitimate use, uh, Krista, what's the tax treatment of NFTs and the proceeds from the sale of NFTs? Yeah, so I think it goes back to what you were saying that the authorities like to look at NFTs as property. So even though you don't physically maybe hold something in your hand, it's property for purposes of when you're looking at transacting. And it, it, similarly with, with, with the cryptocurrency. So if you buy an NFT for cryptocurrency, we're looking back at the, you know, the fur trading days where you gave a fur coat for a piece of wood, you had a transaction, did you make money? Yes or no? I mean, it it's, can be just as basic as that when you're looking at the transaction and how to report it. The tax authorities want their money. If you make money, whether it's real money or virtual money, they're gonna want their share of that income that you're making. And that's pretty much it, I guess. Um, there's, you know, it's interesting because it comes down to, uh, similarly with art, I mean, we, we constantly go back to art when we look at this, is what's the value? What are we receiving when you're trading one thing for another that's property? And you have to look at it in a third party mindset saying, what would a third party give me for this transaction? And that's what I make the money. And you look at the currency rate translations to do that. So it, it can become gray, I guess, if you will. But uh, as you said, there's laws in place already that deal with a lot of those gray areas of property of art, of related company transactions, et cetera, that will just flow into this once they tell us and slowly define what they think this property is. And, and, and they've come out and said they, they view it as property, basically. And typically, there's different treatment of money that you receive, whether it's income, whether it's capital gains, and I can get my capital gains exemption. Uh, maybe give the audience an idea of you know when it would be treated as income, when it would be a capital gain, or for some, a massive capital loss. <laughs> yeah, or, or self-inflicted massive capital losses. Um, you know, it, it, again, it comes down to any type of business transaction you're doing. And, it, and it, a lot of times, we look at these the same way that we would look at uh, securities. What, what are you doing for NFTs? Are you the creator of the NFT? Are you the one selling that property as the creator of that intellectual property? If you are, you're likely looking <clears throat> at, cap, or at income. It's ordinary income, it's business income. You can take expenses against it similarly to any other type of income that you're going to report. Where it comes into it is, are you doing this as a hobby? Which is the interesting thing because are you truly in the trade of business of creating and selling F NFTs. If you are, perfect, you can take expenses. If you're not, they're gonna look at you as, as a hobbyist, meaning we get to tax you, but you don't actually get to take advantage of anything that happened to create that income. So you can run into a risk. And then the third thing that they look at, so you can either have income, you can be a hobby incomeist, or is it capital gains and capital losses? And capital gains and capital losses are treated similarly that you would treat any type of investment property that you're doing. So if you're a purchaser of an NFT, similar to if you're a purchaser of art, and you're buying it for the purpose of your own use, I'm gonna use this, I want to enjoy this for a wallpaper, I think I heard someone say yesterday on their computer, or whatever, hang it on their wall in a digital screen, then that might be capital in nature. And when you sell it, if you sell it for more than you bought it, you have capital gains. And you would report those capital gains and it'd be taxed as a capital gain with the preferential tax rates. But if you're a person who is trading similarity in securities, if you're gonna buy and sell 
NFTs for the purpose of raising a profit and you're constantly looking for those low ones to flip and sell, um, similar to real estate, if you're a house flipper, it's going to be income to you. It's not going to be a capital gain and you're going to pay the full rates for tax purposes. So you really, I, I mean, you generally every individual, there's not a blanket answer saying, I'm going to report this as a capital gain or I'm going to report this as income because any, every individual has a different situation and detailed analysis that kind of goes into it and that's a very legal answer. I'm going to do a detailed analysis of your transactions. But it's, you have to, you have to, you have to because that's what they're going to do if they're going to come in and look at it. And a lot of times I have people coming to me saying, well, how are they going to know? I mean, how are they going to track this? How are they going to trace this? But then we go back to anti-money laundering rules. It's what if they find out? And that's where you're at risk. You don't want to be that person that's the tax evader, creating fraud, et cetera. We're not doing the 101, how to anti-money launder, right? It's, it, maybe it might be hard for them today, but guaranteed they're going to find the systems to find it somehow eventually. And it's being that person that decided not to do it until you got caught. And it, you know, I, I agree, if I had still the number one currency that's out there when you're looking at transacting and avoiding. Uh, it's untraceable, just like a lot of NFT or, or cryptocurrency at this point, but that doesn't make it right, if you will. Uh, and then you asked about losses. So, um, you know, it, it would be treated similarly to any other property losses, and you have to look at it is it investment? Can I take this as an investment loss against other investment capital gains and offset? Or is it personal property that I'm creating a property? So like I bought my car and I sold it for 10,000 when I bought it for 20,000, I don't get to take a capital loss on my tax return. So it's similar to those types of things. You have to look at what the intent of the property is that you've purchased. And if you purchased it for investment purposes, then you have the potential to take a loss against other capital gains on your return. Great, thank you. So you may want to consult a a specialist in digital assets uh, when you're dealing with your taxes uh, rather than, and you may want to ask your accountant, are you familiar with digital assets? Are you familiar with the treatment of them uh, so that you can accurately report to Revenue Canada in our case? Okay, next is the metaverse. And we've heard a lot about it, a lot of hype about it. Facebook changed its name to now meta, right? I'm sure that's going to change everything for Facebook. So it's got a lot of media buzz, it's got headlines, it's got interest. We've got now the adoption of NFTs in the metaverse. How do you think that will impact, I guess, one, uh, do you think it's going to increase NFTs substantially? you think it's a bubble? Uh, and then what sort of regulation do you think we should have around this? Or do you think we should regulate this? I can take a stab at it. I'm definitely not an expert on, um, you know, the metaverse and, and uh, how popular it's going to become and when it's going to become popular. I think there's already use cases for NFTs in the metaverse already that we're seeing. So I imagine if the metaverse really takes off, it will increase NFTs. I can't. It seems like a logical pairing. Um, and I don't know. Um, uh, I don't know that it changes the analysis of NFTs. Whether you're using an NFT in a metaverse environment um, or for another reason, I think it's still going to be looking at case by case, the purpose, the analysis, how it's marketed to people, um, and the same regulations that already exist are going to apply to the NFTs, whether, whether it's in a metaverse or, or not. Yeah, I think... Is this working? Yeah, I think, I think that's right. I, I, the one thing I want to point out is a lot of time in technology, in this space and, and, and more broadly, people create these, like a metaverse, a different, a different space, a different whatever, and think, oh, well, the rules don't apply anymore. Oh, there's no laws in my metaverse. I've created this little space and there's no law anymore. Like, yeah. at, at the end of the day, we're still in the real world, regardless if there is a metaverse. <laughs> so, you know, if the metaverse does actually take off, whether it's Facebook's version of metaverse or there's a, you know, some other one, it doesn't change anything. If it becomes more popular, then yes, NFTs will maybe become more popular if they're used there. Um, but it doesn't change the fact, and the difficulty is, you know, I may be in Canada sitting in this borderless metaverse online somewhere, um, but I'm in Canada, and the Canadian rules still apply to me, and anyone selling to me in Canada is subject to Canadian rules, or should be, or, you know, so it adds some complexity, but, the, you know, there's no, you can't create a new world and say, oh, the laws don't apply here. 
You know, it's interesting you talk about this metaverse because part of the tax laws is the, the foreign reporting rules, and they treat this metaverse as a foreign place for reporting, right? So now we have this whole new universe that is considered foreign reporting for purposes of people's tax reporting, which is, it's interesting to me, but it's true because they, it's, it's, it's its own universe or country or whatever, right? I'll just add in the other realms this could go in. Like my, my two sons are like obsessed with Minecraft and like, you know, they go on there and they're killing each other or killing other things or knocking down their buildings. Like, I don't know if there's criminal charges that could be at play, but you know, <laughs> realistically, they, there there could be. If there's if all of a sudden there's value to that and you destroy someone's property, how is that criminally dealt with? Like that's it's it's a, a whole you know it's a big can of worms. What if it was murder for hire? Then that's also another. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. We have a money laundering issue. But the, the the problem we have in the metaverse is this whole idea of I identity, right? It's hard enough in in the in the real world uh, to figure out who's who and to, to prevent identity fraud. But if you can create any number of avatars, any number of identities in this space, who are you dealing with? Um, how, how do you follow it from a tax perspective? How do you follow it from a money laundering perspective? Uh, it's a worry. Yeah. And it's interesting you raise the the identity issue, right? Is you don't know where they are, you don't know who they are, you don't know what they're representing. Uh, maybe what they're representing is true, maybe it isn't. Uh, how do you think that we can deal with that? How do you think we can certify who that person is on the other end of the keyboard so that you know you can have that trust? Or how do you think we can develop that trust? Perhaps not, that's not a question for Cat an account. Maybe that's a life real. coach issue. <laughs> Catfishing's real. <laughs> yeah, I, listen, I mean, I, I, um, uh, digital identity is the way that uh, is the way that most countries are going and must go. The, the, the problem, the, 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 the constant conflict, though, is, is, that, um, is between privacy and identity, right? And so, you know, when you're dealing in a metaverse, do you want to be somebody else? Um, and you should be able to be somebody else. It, it, it comes down to the interactions where there are transactions where um, the validation of identity, probably through a digital identity mechanism, is going to become essential. Uh, uh, I'll say the one thing I'll caution is I have a client right now who is doing some stuff where they required AML, you know, procedures and everything, and they've got a third party uh, involved who's a specialist in that area to vet everyone. And the first batch of, of uh, participants that came through, uh, one of the guys at the business just said, one of, the, <laughs> one of the guys at the business just looked at it online and said, well, this whole thing with your whole online screening process, and I can look at this ID and with my bare eyes can tell it is completely phony. And so as much as everyone says, oh, well, we just brought in a third party supply, uh, you know, third party uh, onboarder to do all our KYC and AML, like you can't just trust those third parties to do that because now our client has an issue that all their people are potentially not properly vetted because they relied on uh, unreliable third party. Great. I'd like to thank our panel. I greatly appreciate your participation today. And I think their Twitter handles are up there. So please feel free to, to speak to them. Questions. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. So let's start with a question. We're still getting our coffee in. Yes. It's very early for me. This is only like 9.30, well, 9.45. It's really far up. You're Thank close. Thank you. All right. Uh, like yesterday, these catch boxes allow for you to ask a question for those who weren't here for uh, for the uh, the uh, new moderators. And so, what you'll just do is just put up your hand, pay attention so that you don't end up getting bonked on the head, and we'll just uh, continue on for about 15 minutes. And if you don't like our answer, you're not allowed to bean us with a <laughs> with a cube. Hey, we got the guy with the white box. Go ahead. Guy with the white box. Hey, Richard. Um, as someone, also someone who's a lawyer by training and has seen um, the financial crisis be spurned by um, credit default swaps squared and uh, multi tranches of products that people don't understand, I'm a believer that you can't legislate against greed. And I wonder if um, that's something that you, the panel can speak to and the concern on the grow, this you know, being an aspect um, in the growth of this industry, um, and, you know, particularly, yeah, the, 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 the trust factor, I think, uh, if you could comment a little on that, because again, I don't think all the laws and regulations will help you at the end of the day, 
if someone is uh, you know so poised to go after it, you can't legislate against greed. That's sort of what I've been always worked with. So. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think you're right. There'll always be abuses. I think you need the regulations to give enforcement the tools they need to, to deal with it um, without anything. I mean, there's nothing people could do. I think another piece that um, is going to become increasingly important is education. So we've seen that really good um, education from, um, in my world, the securities uh, commissions around Ponzi schemes, pump and dump, the traditional kind of stock. Uh, scams that happen and I think this is just another area where there will have to be more public education about scams that can happen, letting people know um, what their rights are, what they should be looking for when they're looking to invest in an NFT. So I think that's probably uh, something that will come and uh, it, it will be important for to help protect the public as well as the regulations. You know, you're right and I'm thinking from a tax perspective, I mean most tax systems are voluntary in nature, if you will, self-disclosure of a lot of income. There's regulations for certain types of income, but at the end of the day, reporting is uh, voluntary and you get to choose to be honest or not honest when you're looking at what you're reporting for income on your tax return and paying tax on. And I mean, there are always going to unfortunately be those individuals who find the loopholes who that may not be the most ethical uh, transactions that are taking place, but but rest assured, the governments do have their ways to figure out if people are not reporting their income, and it's not by what's your identity digitally. It's not by uh, a token that has your name on it versus an avatar's name on it. There's many different mechanisms in which the authorities can go back and say, uh, "You're living beyond your means. Where's your money coming from?" And, and they will look, and I, I know that they have started to dig into this and audit it. So it is something that is on their radar from the taxing authorities around the world, not just in Canada, as to what are we missing? And it's no different with offshore trusts, people hiding money offshore, et cetera. It, 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 it will fall into that. So I agree, you can't regulate out the greedy people, if you will. Um, but they can put mechanisms in place to ensure that they properly define it to protect their position in court, why it should be taxed. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, go ahead. Uh, first of all, thank you so much. This was a very, very educational uh, talk. Um, as someone who has a presence in the metaverse and is selling NFTs uh, from a charitable perspective, if you could talk a little bit about um, intellectual property as it relates to the NFT, uh, for the individual that's creating the art and how a charity should think about that. Uh, and, and my specific example is related to the Brain Computer Interface initiative. And it wasn't so much a, a thought when we weren't working with iMining, but now that we've actually moved forward in this direction and if uh, the, the NFT were to sell for any material amount of money, you know, thinking about the individual who created that art and the compensation of their intellectual property is something that we're thinking about uh, quite deeply. So interesting, your thoughts on that. Thank you. All right, so I'll preface that I'm not an intellectual property expert, but an NFT, as I said earlier, an NFT itself means nothing. There's intellectual property rules and rights that, that go along with it. So the question is always, if you're buying an NFT that represents a piece of art of some sort, where do you have a record of what rights are being transferred to you? In a typical agreement, you know, I'm going to buy a piece of artwork. You know, do you do you get all the rights that, that to exploit it? Like that's really what, what we're talking about. If you want to use it as a banner, if you want to print, print it on T-shirts, well, who has that right? The creator, the person who bought a, a digital image of it. Who knows? There's, it's, it's not inherent. You have to have. The, 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 the terms and the bundle of rights that comes with anything has to be apparent. Um, I, was, I was talking with someone else about uh, entertainment, it was an entertainment lawyer, and she was saying, and I know I'm getting a little bit off track, but it will, it will, it will circle back, I promise. And she was saying, oh, she's, she works for a TV company, and they buy book options. And they always say, okay, there's, there are, you wrote a book, you have the right to your book, excerpts of text from your book, that's your right. We're gonna option it. We're gonna make a movie or a TV show. I get, we get all digital rights to 
all the images of the movie, all the character names or anything that's different from the movie, we get those rights. And it's very detailed, these agreements on what rights everybody gets when they want to put an image, like a Harry Potter image on the t-shirt, you'll see it's Warner Brothers. It is not, um, it is not J.K. Rowling because they've decided if they're going to have an image of, of anything from the movie, it's them. But if it's the image of a book cover on a t-shirt, it's it's potentially J.K. Rowling or the publisher or whoever. So those rights are very heavily negotiated. And in a recent one, she said, and the author is saying they want to keep all NFT rights. And she asked me, well, so, you know, what does that mean? What is an NFT? Should we do? Should we give it? And I said, I don't know. NFT people you want. You could have an, MF an NFT that is a image from the movie. And you know, in that scenario, you want it. If, if it's an NFT, which is just a line of text from the book, and you take every sentence of the book, and I'm going to have 10,000 NFTs of each sentence of my book and send them out there, that would be the author's. So the fact that it's an NF NFT is meaningless. Like, that's not, not relevant. The question is, when, you know, in that project, if someone took an image, what, what were they intending to provide? Do they no longer have any rights to that image? Did they say, yes, you can have this image, but I, I want to maintain creator rights and I want to take a royalty and every time it's used and any money earned on that image, I get a royalty from that. If it's not set out there, you're in a big uncertainty. And that's what I, I always fear in a lot of these NFTs. People have no idea what they're getting. And I, I aside from a painting, I always liken it to a baseball card because to me that's it's more relevant. I can own a baseball card. I own this piece of paper. Uh, it's mine. It's non-fungible because there might be other of the same baseball cards, but mine has a little bend on the ear. Who, who knows? They, they, it's, each one is fungible, but I don't own that image. I, don't, I can't make a t-shirt with that baseball player. Like the, the team owns the rights to the logo. The, whoever created the card owns the right to the image and the logos on the card. So what did I buy? You know, if it's not set out in your contract or in the NFT documents or on that platform, I think it's a big problem. You have no idea. So. And I think it's starting to be enforced a little. I was reading recently about, I think, I can't remember if it was Marvel or DC, they had to send a letter out to all their artists saying, like, stop selling the art, you don't own it, we do. Um, so it's very interesting because it's kind of two parts. It's what, what are you getting and then what kind of due diligence do you maybe want to do to find out if the person purporting to give you those rights actually has those rights to give to you, so. And there was an excellent article in the Wall Street Journal fairly recently about artists and uh, trailer royalties for future purchases. So you may want to take a look at that, but it goes back down to, uh, you know, your smart contract. What's, what have you incorporated in there? So, you know, what copyrights uh, are there going to be? Are you going to be bound by Canadian copyright law? Is it international? And if you're going to make changes to that, how are you going to do it expressly through a written agreement, right? In your smart contract that you've got associated with that NFT. Okay, another question. Uh, where's, okay, there we go, the white one. Go ahead. Uh, thanks for the uh, uh, panel discussion. Um, my question is, I guess, directed a little bit at Philip uh, and a pushback on, um, on NFTs and uh, not knowing really what they are. Um, I mean, it, it, uh, it can be argued that they are just a subclass of, of a crypto asset. And an <laughs> NFT is really a, 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 a digital representation of ownership of something. So a product of a smart contract. So essentially a piece of property. So if it's not a piece, if it, if it is a piece of property or a, a, a crypto asset and it can represent ownership in something uh, like in the metaverse, um, buying a piece of land, for example, um, then don't we really d know what it is um, essentially and not know, like your stance is that we don't know what it is. Uh, don't we know what it is and we just need to figure out how to treat it properly under the law? Well, uh, in, that, in that scenario, I keep thinking this turns off. Oh, there you go. In that scenario, like if you have a piece, if so, so you're right. If you bought a piece of land in the metaverse and you have something that indicates that yes, you have a right to that land and what the parameters are, yeah, you know what it is. If you know, if if the metaverse is you know the back back end software is owned by Meta or the company, whatever, and they decide to update their software, you know, we're going to make all the land or wherever your thing is, whatever the coordinates are. I don't know how the metaverse works. We're going to make everything blue. Or actually, you know, we're ditching that part of the software, we're gonna make it all this way. And that somehow impacts your real estate, your, your metaverse real estate or something because the backend technology has changed. What rights do you have? Like you don't, but, well, I, I don't know. And so that's like, when I, if, you, if, if you have your rights and you know you own that land and what comes with it, then, then you're right, we know. When I say we don't know what the NFT is, it's because a lot of the time people don't know it. It's not set up. There are no details as to what rights you get. So if you, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. If you know what you get, then you do know if it's just, hey, I, I 
took a JPEG, I somehow stuck it onto an NFT and put it out in the world and someone bought it, you know, if there, if there aren't details of what they own, they own a copy of that JPEG. But as Melissa said, you don't know, did the person who sell it to you have rights to sell? Do they have rights to copy, to copy it and, and reproduce it and everything? You know, unless it's set out, you, you really don't know. You know, it's interesting because I think when you're looking at the legal ramifications of a lot of transactions, you you have to look at different buckets of law. Contract law, rights law, tax laws, ownership laws, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And everyone potentially will define something a little bit different. And I think about it, for instance, working with individuals, when they come to Canada, you have to look at immigration law, you have to look at tax law, and those two may not say the exact same thing, but it doesn't mean that they're both right, or they're both right at the end of the day. So when you're looking at regulating, and you're right, there's some intuitiveness that comes to it going, well, this is obviously what it is intuitively, but under particular laws, it might not be so intuitive. So for tax law, yeah, I mean, it's pretty well out there administratively, it's property. But for copyright and ownership laws, what does that mean, right? So it's what type of law you're looking at. Sorry, we got time for uh, one more question. Is the okay, perfect just up here? The okay. <laughs> How do I do this? Hello. Oh, okay, great. Uh, thank you for this panel. It's been really, really fascinating. Um, my question, uh, potentially, you sort of, kind of answered it a little bit with with the intention of what you own the NFT or the cryptocurrency or whatever it is for. But the one thing that I kind of can't understand is. You know, you, let's say, and this probably applies to directly to NFTs as well, but if you were to say purchase a cryptocurrency and your intention to purchase a cryptocurrency was to as an investment, when you're, you want to be an honest citizen and you want to report to your accountant uh, for tax purposes that you own this cryptocurrency, um, if I didn't sell the cryptocurrency to back to Canadian dollars and it's just sitting there, but now it's, it's gone up in value, and I, my understanding is I still have to report that and I still have to say that I made money. But then, you know, a month later, <laughs> it drops down and I lose tons and tons and tons of value. Do I have the opportunity now to say that I've, I've got a loss? Or like, how does that kind of play out in the end? Yeah, so I mean, cryptocurrency at the end of the day, for tax reporting purposes, as what you're talking about, you're looking at the currency and hedging, if you will, hedging your bet like you would with any other currency, US currency, whatever, right? So you're looking to say, did I make money or did I not make money and how quickly and readily accessible is this money to me? And uh, generally as individuals with investment, if, if it's an unrealized gain, you're not going to report tax on an unrealized gain that has happened. Uh, it really, if, if it, you're purely an investor. Now, if you are in the business of hedging and wanting to make money, for sure, you're going to pay tax uh, as you kind of do it because you're, you're hedging and that's what you say. This is how I'm making my money. This is who I am and how I want to earn a living. If you're an investor, uh, similar if you buy a stock in, in Facebook, um, you're not going to recognize it until you sell it because you don't you haven't you haven't realized anything and tomorrow it could be worth nothing and then why would you report something that doesn't happen so you really have to go back behind the intent of are you looking at capital or are you looking at income and who is it to you as a person okay thank you great we'd like to thank the panel thank you for your expert uh, opinions and advice this morning uh, if you do want to reach out to them, their Twitter handles are up top here. Feel free to reach out to them. I'm sure they'll be happy to answer uh, any questions that you've got. Thank you.